رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وضيائها وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم وصلي عليه we are studying hadith number 74 so I've recited the hadith and the translation so uh, briefly this hadith uh, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was shown the nations all the nations of uh, the prophets alayhi salatu wasalam the umam the plural of ummah and he saw that some prophets had small group of less than 10 people in the ummah uh, some uh, a prophet with him was one man in the ummah two men in the ummah and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam even saw a prophet who had not a single person in his ummah then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw a huge group and thought that this was his ummah and he was informed that this is musa alaihi salam and his ummah uh, however look to the side so the Prophet ﷺ looked to one side and saw a huge group. Then he looked to the other side and saw another huge group. And he was told, this is your ummah. The biggest of all of the groups. This is the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. And it was said that from amongst them, 70,000 people, 70,000 Muslims will enter Jannah without accountability and without any punishment. So there'll be no hisab kitab, there'll be no questioning, and there'll be no punishment. And 70,000 people like this will be able to enter Jannah. And then the Prophet ﷺ left and the Sahaba started to discuss who these people may be. And some Sahaba said that uh, perhaps these are those people who accompanied the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba. Some said maybe these are those people who were born in Islam and had never done any shirk, polytheism, in their entire life. As they were discussing this, the Prophet ﷺ emerged and asked them and then informed them that these people who will enter Jannah with no accountability or punishment are people who لا يرقون, they, do not, they do not do ruqya وَلَا يسترقون, They do not seek ruqya وَلَا يتطيرون. This can either mean they do not perceive bad omen or it can mean they are not pessimistic people وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يتوكلون. And they rely upon their Lord They have tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned four characteristics of these people who will enter Jannah without accountability. I'm going to explain what do we mean by <coughs> pessimistic or uh, having perceiving bad omen. One of the meanings is uh, to believe in superstitions. So inshallah, when I comment on that, I'll explain a bit more. So these are the four things that I mentioned regarding these people who will enter Jannah without accountability and without punishment. They do not do ruqya, they do not seek ruqya, uh, they have tawakkul, true reliance on Allah, and uh, sorry, uh, number three, they are not pessimistic or they do not perceive bad or men, or they are not superstitious. And number four is that they have tawakkul upon their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a Sahabi, Ukasha ibn Muhsin, radiallahu anhu, he stood up and he said, Oh Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, do dua for me that I am amongst these people who will enter Jannah with no hisab and no adab. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam say? Why are you asking me? Ask Allah. Do dua to Allah? No. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Anta minhum, you are from amongst them. Done. You're amongst them. Another Sahabi stood up and said, Oh Prophet وسلم, do dua for me as well. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Well, Ukasha has beaten you. He's asked first, uh, in other words. And this hadith is muttafaq alayh. What does that mean? When a hadith is muttafaq alayh? Yes? 
MashaAllah. Well done, Shazib. Narrated by both Imam Muslim and Imam Bukhari in their respective uh, compilations. Well done. So, we'll continue with the commentary of this hadith now. First and foremost, just a bit about the Sahabi, Ukasha, radiallahu an. Uh, who was Ukasha? Briefly, Ukasha is known as Aftal Sahaba wa khiyaruhum wa shuja'uhum wa shuja'anuhum He is known as the best of the Sahaba the most uh, bravest from amongst the Sahaba The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one hadith said regarding him Minna khayru farisin fil Arab We have the best horse rider from amongst the Arabs Who was that? Ukasha radiallahu and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam praised him that he is the best horse rider. The story of Ukasha is actually quite famous in the seerah. In one battle, Ukasha radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the battle of Badr, Ukasha radiallahu ta'ala anhu was fighting and he fought so much that his sword broke. Imagine that, he's fighting so much, his sword broke into pieces. So what does he do? He comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam gives him a piece of wood. It says, fight with this. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam gives him a piece of wood and fight with this. As soon as he takes the piece of wood into his hands, mu'jiza, a prophetic miracle occurs and the piece of wood turns into a shining metal sword. And then Ukasha enters a battlefield with this. And the Muslims become victorious in the battle of Badr. Ukasha keeps this and he names this sword Al-Aun, which means the help. So this sword he named it Al-Aun, the help. And he continued to fight using this sword throughout his life, his entire life. Thereafter, every single battle that he would participate in, he would be holding the wooden stick of the Prophet wasallam. This was a mu'jiza until uh, the Ayyam uh, ridda the time of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, it's known as Ayyam uh, ridda many um, munafiqeen hypocrites left Islam. And Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and who waged war against them, uh, apostates, uh, murtaddeen, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and who went in uh, war against them. And Ukasha was also on the side of the Muslims and fought and he passed away uh, during Ayyam uh, ridda radiallahu ta'ala anhu the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam praised him much and again you see here that he hears about this and what is his aspiration i want to be from amongst these people and this was the mindset of the sahaba uh, a mindset where they're constantly aiming they constantly they have a target and they have to reach that target i was reading something uh, recently uh, is a comment regarding progress that progress and development, we all aspire to have pr progress in our life. In our life we want progress, we want development. But true progress and true development can only exist if you have a purpose. If you have a purpose, then you can have progress and development. If you have no purpose, then you will not... What that is, is not progress. What that is, is not development. Because development and progress is measured by the purpose. So if one was to say that in Western society there is progress, there is development, that would only be valid if Western society had a purpose. So what is it? It is mere change. This is called change. It's not called progress. As Muslims we have a purpose. In a Muslim society we have a purpose. So in a society where there is a purpose, that change is known as progress, that change is known as development. Where there is no purpose, that progress and development is just change. There is no progress. Why? Progress is when you, you get to your destination, but th there is no destination. There's always a constant change. This is not progress. As something very interesting mentioned by uh, Naqib al-Attas, who mentioned this in his book, that if there is no purpose, there is no progress. Do we have progress in our lives? That depends, do we have purpose? If you have a purpose in your life, 
then you can have progress and development. But if there is no purpose in your life, there is no progress and development. It is mere change. You've just changed. What is our purpose? Our purpose is to become better believers, to become better worshipful servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we are improving in our actions and in our spirituality or emotions, and we have a target to reach, then we are progressing. If you have started to uh, pray your five daily prayers, there's progress because you have a goal. If you have some kind of bad quality inside you, maybe you have jealousy inside you, and you're trying hard to get rid of that jealousy, this is progress. Why? Because the ultimate purpose is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do I please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? By bettering myself, by getting rid of these uh, ill traits, these, these defects, and by adopting these qualities. If you are in this process of getting rid of uh, defects from your character, answering back, for example, adults, disrespecting parents, you want to get rid of this. Many people get angry quickly. And amongst the youth, this becomes a, a praiseworthy quality. People are given, brothers are given nicknames, street names, based on how crazy they are. This is not a good thing. This is something you want to get rid of. And if you can, and you're in the process of getting rid of these bad qualities, and adopting good qualities, and fulfilling Allah's commands, reading your namaz, reciting the Qur'an, giving your zakat when it's fard, performing hajj if it's fard, fasting in the month of Ramadan, this is progress. Otherwise, there is no progress. So we need to make our lives purposeful. When we wake up, we have a purpose. You know the Prophet ﷺ, when he would walk, the Prophet ﷺ would walk mildly fast. The Prophet ﷺ would have a fast pace in his walk. And at times, even though they were just moderate steps, it was a miracle that Sahaba who were taller physically than the Prophet ﷺ, who would have physically longer legs, when they would walk with the Prophet ﷺ, they would have to run to keep up with the Prophet ﷺ. But the question is why? Why was the Prophet ﷺ walking in such a manner? Why wasn't the Prophet ﷺ walking slowly? What's the hikmah, the wisdom in the, the fast-paced walk, moderately fast paced walk of the Prophet ﷺ, the hikmah, the wisdom is this. Imagine you see somebody walking in the street, and he's, got, he's walking in one direction, and he's got faster pace than normal. The first thing in your mind is, this person has somewhere to be, something to do. This person has somewhere to be, has something to do. But then on the other hand, you see somebody else walking. Walking slowly, left and right, left and right. He's got all the time in the world looking into his phone, stands there for three minutes just answering a text and then walks a bit again. You're thinking this person has all the time in the world. This person does not have somewhere to be. This person does not have something to do. Even in the walk of the Prophet ﷺ, we see that the Prophet ﷺ had a purpose. Even in his walk, there was purpose. So when we wake up in the morning, we need to have a purpose to our day. When we have a certain task, Fulfill that task. Become active people, not passive people. And this has been the hallmark of the Muslims. The Muslims have always been active people and not passive people or reactive people. We have always been active people. We have a purpose in our life. You need to fulfill certain things. In reality, in reality, there is no chill day for us. There is no day where we will just rest because we always have a purpose and on the most basic level on the most basic level our purpose is pray your five daily prayers any other obligation you have fulfill it and stay away from the prohibitions and this is so easy at the end of the day to have to sit and reflect have i fulfilled my obligations of today today is friday so before you sleep, sit down. Have I fulfilled my obligations of today? 
the, the obligations of Allah, the rights of Allah and the rights of people. These are two obligations. The rights of Allah, your daily prayers, have I fulfilled them? Yes. The rights of people, have I fulfilled the rights of my parents? Have I fulfilled the rights of my children? Have I fulfilled the rights of my siblings? Yes. Then on the other hand, have I broken uh, any of, have I violated any uh, prohibitions? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told me not to fornicate, did I? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered me not to backbite, did I? If you have this um, dichotomy, this division in our mind before we sleep and reflect, it becomes easier to reflect and imagine going before going to sleep realizing you fulfilled all of Allah's commands and you have not broken any of his prohibitions that is on a basic level a successful purposeful day if you can go to sleep and say to yourself I fulfilled the commands of today and I have uh, abstained from the prohibitions of today uh, what more do you want that's a beautiful day you've lived what more do you want so from the fa just the, the one question of Sayyidina Ukasha, we realize that our lives need to be lives of purpose. Every decision we make, there must be a purpose behind this. I'm choosing these subjects in school. Why? What's your purpose? Why have you selected these subjects? These are the subjects I've selected in college or sixth form. Why? What's the purpose? University, why? What's the purpose? This job, this profession, why? What's the purpose? These decisions I am making, these steps I am taking, what's the purpose? For everything we do, we need to have a purpose. I'm earning money. What's the purpose? This is so important. What's the purpose of earning money? You might have heard the story of a man who's like lying under a tree in the shade of a tree and he's resting somebody comes up to him and wakes him up and said wake up and he wakes up and he said why he said because you need to work he said why to earn money to earn a livelihood he said why so that you can look you can get married look after your wife and have children look after your wife he said, why? So that they can grow up and then you can get them married. He said, why? So that you could rest and be peaceful. He said, I'm resting and I'm peaceful right now. <laughs> why would I go through all of that to come back here? So we need a purpose in everything that we do. If the, if the one who woke him up said, for the pleasure of Allah, then they would have been different. Now earn money so that you can look after your family for the pleasure of Allah. Then the, the, the story ends there. So we need purpose in everything that we do, the decisions that we make. We need to know why. Why are you choosing this path? Why have you made this decision? All of this, you know, comes down to one thing. All of this, what I've said in the last 10-15 minutes, comes down to one thing. If you know your identity, everything else will fall into place. If you know who you are, everything else will fall into place. Who am I? A slave of Allah. What's my purpose? To please Allah. That's my identity. Everything else is secondary. Then everything will revolve around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your decisions, the purpose behind those decisions. And they'll be fruitful as well, inshaAllah. So, these people have, who will enter Jannah with no accountability, hisab, no punishment, adab, have four qualities. Number one, la yarqoon. Number two, la yastarqoon. They do not do ruqya and they do not seek ruqya. What is ruqya? Ruqya is a recitation of certain words by means of which you seek cure. So ruqya is a recitation of words, an incantation, waza'if, awrad, recitation of certain words by means of which you seek shifa, by means of which you seek a cure. 
or a deliverance from a problem some kind of betterment whether it is a cure from an illness whether it is a deliverance from a problem this is ruqya now in this hadith it said that these people are people who do not do ruqya but we know from other hadith sahih hadith where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam encouraged ruqya recitation of awrat the famous uh, story of the Sahabi, a group of Sahaba who were traveling and um, they met a, a tribe and they asked the tribe to give them some food and drink. And this was a custom of the Arabs that if some travelers come your way, you would give them some food and drink. But this tribe didn't give them anything. Then a person from the tribe was bitten by a snake, by a poisonous snake. So then the news spread. And then one Sahabi went to the people and said, I can cure him, but I want a goat in return. He said, okay. So what did he do? He recited Surah Al-Fatiha and blew it on the person. And the person was given Shifa. So then he was given a goat. But then he thought, the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell me to do this, so maybe I've done wrong. So let's, before we even think of eating this goat, let's go to the Prophet ﷺ and see whether what I've done is allowed. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ and he informed the Prophet ﷺ that he had recited Surah Al-Fatiha for Shifa and he was given a goat in return and whether it's permissible for him. And the Prophet ﷺ did not just say yes. The Prophet ﷺ said, give me some meat as well. So it's permissible. What you done was good. You recited the Kalam of Allah with the intention of Shifa. Allah gave you the Shifa. This goat, not only you eat it, give me some as well and I'll eat it too. Or I'll distribute it as well. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how do we reconcile between these two seemingly contradictory traditions? On one side, reciting uh, words with the intention of Shifa, bi'idhnillah, is permissible. And on the other side, these people will be given Jannah for not doing Ruqya. So you'll find many different positions. So if you read the commentaries on this specific part, you'll find that uh, there are many commentaries given. So one commentary is that they do not do Ruqya. So this is Sheikh Muhammad Ali uh, As-Sabuni's uh, commentary, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. If I remember correctly, they say that ruqya uh, is two types. You have one type of ruqya which is mashru, which is legal, Islamically legal. Then you have another type of ruqya which is illegal, غير mashru. The legal, permissible ruqya is that which is taken from the Quran. And that which is taken from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that's permissible. So if you recite Quran with intention of ruqya, if you recite ad'iyah uh, ma'thura, du'as from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or sahaba or tabi'in, then this is permissible. Ibn Kamal Fasha rahimahullah taala he adds to this. He adds to this permissible type of ruqya, and he says. The names, reciting names of angels is a permissible type of ruqya. Reciting the names of the prophets is a permissible type of ruqya. Reciting the names of the awliya and salihin is permissible. Like the um, famous uh, ruqya of the name of the uh, people of Kahaf, the people of the cave. Their name is a valid ruqya as well. Many ulama, scholars, write the name of the people of the cave uh, in, uh, or recite their names as well uh, with intention of Shifa and Ibn Kamal says this is permissible Arsh, Kursi, Samawat you know using these blessed names with the intention of Shifa is permissible with which intention? with the intention that these are all means the shifa Allah will give and these are the means. Just like taking medicine, our belief is this is the means and Allah is the one who will give the real shifa. 
And then you have the second type of ruqya, which is the ruqya which is impermissible. And this was the ruqya which was done in jahiliyyah, in the period of ignorance, in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They would perform. <coughs> they would perform this type of ruqya. They would have certain words that they would say. And using words that are not from Quran and Sunnah and from the ulama, to use them is impermissible. To use them is impermissible. And you also have one position to use names uh, that are not mentioned in our tradition or, or incantations and or rather of other traditions again is impermissible. So they do not do ruqya nor do they seek ruqya. One interpretation, one commentary is they do not do impermissible ruqya. They do not seek impermissible ruqya and they uh, do not perceive bad omen. They are not pessimistic or they are not superstitious and they have tawakkul reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's one commentary regarding ruqya. <clears throat> Ibn Kamal rahimahullah ta'ala gives another commentary, a second one. And it seems that this is more likely to be the commentary. Both are valid. Both are valid. So I wouldn't say any is invalid. But it seems that this is makes more sense. <clears throat> he says that ruqya, they do not do ruqya and they do not seek ruqya. It means the valid type. The valid type of ruqya. They will fall into illness or they'll fall into a problem. But their reliance on Allah and their belief in divine decree is so strong, they will not need anything else. They are happy with Allah's decision. They are in a problem. Of course, these are khawas, these are extremely special people. They will face a tribulation. For example, the uh, Sayyidu Shuhada, Imam Hussein, radiallahu an. We have throughout our lives read and heard the story of Imam Hussein. Yes? Have you ever heard Imam Hussein doing dua that, that these people be defeated and he be given victory and everything ends? All you hear is Imam Hussein, radiallahu an, being patient. Being patient. And this is a very high level of yaqeen, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever happens, I am pleased with. I will not even seek a cure from this. Because I have complete yaqeen and pleasure in the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a very, very high level of yaqeen and tawakkul. Which inshallah, may Allah allow us to reach one day. It's not something you can reach overnight unless you have the gaze of the righteous servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's possible. It's not something which is within the norms. So these people on the day of judgment will enter Jannah with no accountability and no punishment. Why? When troubles came to them, when troubles came to them, they were no troubles. It was no trouble. Somebody once asked, um, in one of his talks, uh, the great uh, Prince of Golara, Pir, uh, Nasiruddin, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, somebody once asked him uh, about Sayyidina Ali, that one of the titles of Sayyidina Ali is Mushkil Kusha, the one who relieves the problems. And he said, if he is Mushkil Kusha, then why didn't he relieve the problem of his own son, Imam Hussein? And he said, you, you don't understand. You only, re you only relieve a problem from the one who considers it a problem. This was Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Bring a million Yazids in front of him, this was no problem for him. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So this is a second commentary of uh, those people who do not do, who are pleased, who are pleased with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now question here, what should we do then, when we come into a problem, when we have some uh, problem and we want to recite some awrad, some ruqya to get rid of these problems, what should we do? Ibn Kamal 
He says, people are given advice according to their capacity. Do you remember in the hadith of Ka'ab bin Malik? When Ka'ab bin Malik said he wants to give all of his wealth to thank Allah, what did the Prophet wasallam say to him? No. And then he said two-thirds. The Prophet wasallam said no. Then he said one-third. The Prophet wasallam said, okay, that's fine. But Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu came, gave every single thing, every coin he had. The Prophet ﷺ didn't say to him, keep some. The Prophet ﷺ accepted everything from him. Why? These are two people on two different levels. Those people who are on that level of the extremely righteous, they are people who can live with trial and tribulation and be satisfied and do not find the need to raise their hands to rid themselves of these problems. But people like us, we need to u- utilize these ruqyas, these adi'iyah, these supplications to get rid of these problems. And we train ourselves. We train ourselves to eventually attain this a level of um, pleasure in the divine decree. This does not happen overnight. This requires training. So that's how we understand the two. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to reach that level. Uh, but remember, uh, reaching any uh, spiritual uh, level, any spiritual elevation, uh, brings its trials and tribulations. It's not going to be easy. And that's why some ulama, they say, do not ask Allah for wilaya, Do not ask Allah for sainthood unless you're ready for the tribulation that's going to come with it. There's a famous hadith mentioned in Ash-Shifa. A sahabi, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I love you. The Prophet ﷺ told him, be careful of what you say. Be careful of what you say. Because the one who loves me, the overview of the hadith, the one who has love for me, will have many trials and tribulations. And that's something that we as Muslims must accept. If we claim to have love for the Prophet ﷺ, we will have trials and tribulations. How can you say, I love you but I'm not going to do anything for you. I love you but I can't bear to you know, stand up for the truth for you. So if you claim, and we do, to love the Prophet ﷺ, we must be ready for every trial and tribulation to prove our love for the Prophet ﷺ. The third characteristic, لا يتطيرون These people do not perceive bad omen. These are people who are not superstitious. These people, they are not superstitious people. لا يتطيرون <coughs> When the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een accepted Islam the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam slowly nurtured them nurtured their character and on the last the farewell, the farewell uh, hajj the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam delivered the khutbah all Muslims should memorize the farewell khutbah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam this is the last khutbah uh, it's known as the last khutbah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where the, the, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "No uh, white has, uh, although the word is no red, has any uh, virtue over a black. No black has any virtue over a red, except by taqwa, God consciousness." It's a famous khutbah. In there, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "I have crushed under my feet the." Uh, ignorant practices of the cultures. This is my interpretation. So from all the different cultures, the Prophet ﷺ did not say, I have crushed all cultures. Because Islam adopts cultures. Islam uh, has love fluidity in it. it. It adopts cultures. But the ignorant practices of cultures, Islam eradicates. So when a person who has an identity, whether he is from the South, uh, South Asian, because our cultures more or less match Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, whether he is from African origin or Arab origin or European, 
whatever culture the person has, when you accept Islam, Islam does not demand for you to leave your culture. Islam demands for you to leave the ignorances within that culture, but you can still have your culture. But you must leave the ignorant practices of the culture. لا يتطيرون These are people who are not people of superstition. And the reason why I mention culture because superstition comes with culture. How many a times in our communities have we come across statements of super, uh, superstition? We have them in England as well. England, by its own culture, has its own superstitions. You know, if you walk under a ladder, then there is bad luck. You see a black cat, then for some reason you have to spill some salt. Or you, you step on a crack, break your mother's back. You know, break a mirror, 12 years of bad luck. This is part of the culture. And a person who has lived within this culture, who has from childhood heard these things, when such a person would accept Islam, things within the culture which do not contradict Islamic values, they're perfectly fine. But things which would contradict Islamic values, you'd have to leave. Now let's relate that back to us. In our communities, our ancestors accepted Islam. And there were many things that they left, but there are many things that they didn't leave. And they continued practicing them, not because they were biased, because of ignorance. There wasn't much knowledge. Most of us are from uh, village areas, meaning our ancestors are from village areas, areas where Islam was not uh, spread as much. And either our ancestors did become Muslims, or they were Muslims, or they were influenced by other cultures. There's many things that have been passed on. For example, a child that is born, they'll shave the entire head and leave a small part of the hair. They will leave a small part of a hair, like a mannat, an oath. This is not from our tradition. Or when somebody's eyes start to flicker, something bad is about to happen. When your right hand starts to itch, I'm going to get some money. When your left hand starts to itch, I'm going to lose some money. Do you know some? Let's see. Have you heard? You must have heard of some. When your ears go red, somebody's talking about you. When your ears go red, somebody's talking about you. <laughs> These are superstitions within our community, um, and. W- by adopting Islam and accepting Islam, there's these things we leave. These things we leave. But we, we leave them under the, uh, the advice of ulama. So not everything would be contradictory to Islam. Not everything within our tradition, our culture would be contradictory to Islam. So when our ulama, the ulama of the Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, when they tell us that X, Y and Z, within the culture is contradictory to Islam, we leave it. A, B and C is not contradictory to Islam. We won't leave it if we don't want to. So the third characteristic of the people who will enter Jannah without accountability and punishment are people who they are, one meaning would be of yatatayyaroon, they are not superstitious. Superstition is contradictory to tawakkul. Because in tawakkul, our reliance is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this reliance is based on yaqeen. Whereas superstition is mere hearsay. It's just something that's been heard and that's been passed on. So that's extremely important. You shouldn't make up anything, make up judgments based on just assumptions. There was a brother, he was meant to get married to a woman and his father passed away so the the marriage was postponed then they set the date for a second time then another rishtadar relative passed away so they then postponed it for a third date and of course at that point the family started thinking maybe there's something wrong with this girl maybe we're not it's not meant to happen That's why people are dying. So then they said to the girl that we're not going to, they said to the son, we're not going to uh, marry this girl into the family. And the son, mashallah, was 
Deen Dar, he knew about Deen. So he said, look, this is, this is nothing. This is just a superstition. This is just a superstition. This is a coincidence. It's happened like this. You can't join these two together and say and make up the superstition that because um, these deaths have happened, therefore this is not meant to happen. And this created a huge argument within the family. So we have this happening within our communities. There are just one or two examples that have come to my mind. But people do this all the time within their families. They'll pass judgments, make life choices based on mere assumptions. Life choices based on mere assumptions. That's a bad omen. You know, this is a, she's a bad omen. Jinx. This, she's a jinx. Wherever this person goes, bad things happen. Jinx, bad omen, superstitions. The Prophet ﷺ has completely eradicated this. When the Prophet ﷺ's son, Sayyidina Ibrahim an, he passed away, there was an eclipse. I can't remember whether it was solar or lunar eclipse, but there was an eclipse. And the people started to say this eclipse has happened because Muhammad ﷺ's son has passed away. The Prophet ﷺ, his son has just passed away. He stood up and he, gave, he de- delivered a sermon and he told them that the, the eclipse does not happen because of someone passing away or because somebody is born. The eclipse is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create fear in the hearts of his servants. So what is the Prophet ﷺ teaching? This is uh, linking bad or men assumptions, superstitions, they have no place in our deen and we leave them. And if there is something that has come across, you've come across or has passed your mind, then you should consult a scholar and say, well, is this a superstition or is this an actual fact? There are certain things that we'll hear, but because we don't know about them, we'll assume that they're bad. For example, I remember hearing from a young age that if you eat fish and milk together, then you'll have um, uh, your the skin color will change. You heard that as well. I forgot what it's called, but that your skin color will change. You'll have patches in your skin. So, as we grew up, we thought this is just another superstition, just another thing that's been said by our elders. But I remember reading in a book of Tib Nabawi, prophetic medicine, that the Prophet sallallahu uh, advised not to mix fish and milk together. So it's good to uh, consult rather than make assumptions. I was going to say, do you know the story of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib when he makes an oath uh, to Allah and the Lord to have children and the draw straws? It, would that constitute superstition or would that be excused because it's true? Yeah, pre-Islam, any stories pre-Islam, that's what we would say. Um, it, might, it may very well be a superstition. Um, but remember pre-Islam, they would even visit fortune tellers. Because my thing is, how would you reconcile that with the lineage of the Prophet? Yeah, the lineage of the Prophet is pure. So the, the brother asked a question about uh, Hazrat Abdul Muttalib radiallahu an and uh, drawing the straws. Oh, what was the narration? Um, it's, I think it was uh, he made an oath to Allah in the last year having children. Yeah. And that, um, if you grab me some of these things, uh, kill one of them. Yeah, yeah. And then it transpired that he didn't want to kill any of them. So he said, I'll, I'll sacrifice, I'll become, uh, sacrifice camels instead. Mm-hmm. And then they drew straws. I don't know if you've heard of How many straws? That, that's how many camels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so when Hazrat Abdul Muttalib had, when he got married, he made an oath. If I have ten sons, then the tenth son I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to do ziba of my tenth son. And his tenth son happened to be Sayyidina Abdullah, the Prophet Sallallahu father, and his most beloved to him. So he didn't do that. Instead, he uh, drew straws. And based on that, he sacrificed that many camels or cattle. Uh, th- that wouldn't be superstition. That's just a, a method. Uh, but there were superstitions in those times the Arabs had, and the Prophet ﷺ eradicated those uh, superstitions. But pre-Islam, these things that would take place, uh, we wouldn't put um, a ruling on that because it's pre-Islam. And 
those are three characteristics and the fourth characteristic of those people who enter Jannah wa ala rabbihim yatawakkalun and they have tawakkul reliance on their lord subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, you can see from this how highly tawakkul is uh, considered the people of tawakkul are people who will enter jannah without accountability without accountability the beauty here is the four things that are mentioned the first three are all incorporated in tawakkul those who have tawakkul on a very high level on a very high level would not do ruqya would not seek ruqya and their tawakkul is such that they would not consider bad omen they would not be superstitious they would not make judgment based on assumptions so in reality what's happened here is that the three have been mentioned individually but all three are also a part of tawakkul if you have tawakkul you will be able to fulfill these three but eventually may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from uh, those people who have true reliance on allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who make decisions uh, that have a valid purpose for the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the next hadith is a hadith of dua so inshallah we're going to start with this in our next lesson uh, hadith 75 onwards inshallah a dua of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asking uh, for tawakkul or, or, or expressing tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen